Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt defended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chef and cup, the, chi the chief, <laughs> chef, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. Keep going. Well, we could stop there real quickly, is that the three of them are in prison. And this is not a close parallel, but you can kind of think it through that there's three people involved here. And two of them escaped from the prison. We're, we're going to see it in a minute, and that one of them didn't. And despite the fact that Jesus and the man next to him died on the cross, they both were resurrected. Jesus was resurrected, and he promised, today you will be with me in paradise. He died after Jesus, being the first person to resurrect from the dead. So you see, as I said, when you're looking for pat patterns and pictures, you can't look for an exact picture, because if you are, then you have the same thing that you're talking about. That's not the way it works. You have to look for things that are subtly intimid intimated there. So one person dies in this prison without any hope, and that would be the guy on the cross on the other side of Jesus, the one that mocked him to the end. But the other guy mocked him at the beginning, but eventually he realized something in the book of Luke. It says that, you know, he, he repented of his ways. So anyway, kind of a picture there of the same thing. You have the three people, and then you also have the symbolism of the chief baker, which you'll see his dream in a minute, and the chief cupbearer. One makes bread, one makes wine. Go back to Melchizedek, go to Jesus, right? The wine and the bread, and that's throughout the Bible. And we'll see that a little more fully developed in a minute. Go ahead. Okay. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream of the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Okay, let's stop there now. And who else named Joseph had a dream? as recorded in the Bible. Daddy. God Smith. Yeah. Dad, father of Jesus, right? So we have a Joseph having a dream. We have a Joseph having a dream. All right? And this is a good pattern. As I said, if you go through, and I've got them all here if you ever want to look at them, but uh, if you go through all 28 of the first books of the Bible and the 28 chapters of Matthew, you will see parallel after parallel after parallel. Joseph in the first book of the Bible, Joseph in the first chapter of Matthew. And that you keep doing this all the way through there. As I said, it, there's 28 chapters of the Bible. There's 28, um, uh, I'm sorry, 28 uh, uh, books of the Bible, 28 chapters of Matthew, and they correspond in so many ways that it is uncanny. Uncanny if you see them. I'll give you one example. If it, You may have heard this if you were in the class earlier, but... Um, in the 27th book of the Bible, Daniel is put in the lion's den. They roll a stone in front of it, and the king seals it. In the 27th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is put in the tomb. They roll a stone over it, and the king seals it, okay? Or Pontius Pilate seals it. And you will see these patterns through every single one of the 28 chapters of Matthew and the 28 first books of the Bible. There's about eight of them in the book of Genesis. This is one of them. Joseph has a dream. Joseph has a dream. It is incredible. There is no way that this could have happened by chance. It is absolutely impossible. This is my own study that I did that, to find these things. But um, uh, it, it could not have happened by chance because these books were not collected at the times that they were written, in most cases, they were compiled many, many years after the people had died. In addition to that, the Hebrew books are not in the same order as the Christian books are. They're the same books of the Bible, but they're in a different order. For example, the book of uh, Chronicle, the book of Kings, the book of Samuel is one book in the Hebrew. It's two books in, uh, in the uh, Christian canon. Malachi does not end the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. Chronicles does. They're all out of order because it's, but for nobody knows the reason why the Christians changed these things, but when they did, it was done under the inspiration of God because these patterns are in there and they point very specifically to Jesus. And like I say, I've got, I, I probably got 50 or more of them, 70 of them, just on those 28 books of Matthew. And these are patterns that go throughout the Bible. This isn't just Matthew, but Matthew does this 28 chapters, 28 books of the Bible. Very interesting, but here's one right here Joseph and Joseph. So please go ahead. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in the custody, custody with him in the master's house, 
Why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Okay, do not interpretations belong to God? And we see that in the book of Daniel. Daniel has a vision or the king has a vision. The people do not interpret themselves. They give the glory to God on the interpretation, just as Joseph does. So all interpretations of dreams come from God, not from people. Okay? And so if anybody says, oh, well, let me interpret your dream here, don't listen to them. And secondly, I don't believe that our dreams have prophetic significance anymore. The Bible is written. It's sealed. I know people that have a dream. They write it down. And then they try to study what the dream means. And I think they're wasting their time personally. That's, you know, we dream, we have bad dreams when we eat the wrong food. We have bad dreams if we drink something that isn't right, it throws our dreams off. That's why uh, Christmas Carol, um, you know, the thing where he sees uh, Bob Marley, the first, not Bob Marley, Bob Marnie. Uh, Marley. Jacob Marnie, yeah, Marley, that's right. He sees, uh, he sees his uh, vision and he's talking to him. He says, ah, oh, you're just a piece of undigested meat. It's because the guy that wrote that understood that your, your food affects your dreams, okay? And so I think it's probably not a sound thing for us to try to be analyzing our dreams. I just don't think so. If you do, that's fine. I, I, I'm not going to belittle you over it. I just don't think it's a, a proper interpretation. To me, that is like doing this. Oh, God, I, I, I really need a job. What do I do? Uh, I, and I know people that do that. They do it all the time. This is how they rule their lives. They let the Bible fall open. They point at it. And, you know, if they don't like what they saw, then they do it again. You know? And <laughs> that just... I, but I do know people that do that kind of thing. And it doesn't get you anywhere. You know, as I said, I, I, Sermon on the Beach last night, I said that we... I was talking, you know, it, it was the hardest sermon I have ever done. And it may be the hardest I ever do because I spoke on the, the Holy Spirit. And... You know, there are people that are there that attend charismatic churches. And I defended why what they do is wrong, speaking in tongues, etc. And I don't know, was I logical, uh, coherent in that? Because, you know, I, I was just speaking out of passion last night. And, but this book was written by who? God. God, but what part, what member of the Godhead? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit through the men who wrote it, okay? So anything in this book... If somebody does something in a church and they say this is of the Holy Spirit and it doesn't match what's in this book, then it can't be of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gave guidelines for speaking in tongues. Okay? He said that no more than three at any service, okay, one at a time, and there must be an interpreter. And then a another thing that he doesn't give a guideline for, but which is you can infer from the text, is that they are all known languages. They are named in Acts 2, Parthians and Medes and Persians and all the different languages. There's no unknown language, okay? Well, I used Richard Roberts as an example. Richard Roberts, the son of Oral Roberts, I watch him every day for a minute or two. I zap to the channel just to get myself angry, and then I turn him off. I do it every single day. But he'll be it, it, preaching, and it, he, he never says anything theologically sound, ever, ever. Nothing he says ever is properly put into context. He takes verses and he applies them to how he can get rich from people. And he says, this is the word of God. Never is it theologically in context, okay? But he'll be speaking and then all of a sudden he'll just go, Shepa, shaka, he and he'll well, he's violating the word of God because he has no interpreter, okay? So it cannot be of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit says you must have an interpreter. And then secondly, as I said, it must be a known language and he just makes stuff up. And he uses... Well, what he does is he uses, and I talked about that first, it says the Spirit himself searches us in groanings that we cannot express. And that's taken entirely out of context. What that is saying is that Charlie Garrett is praying to God. I have something on my heart, and I don't even know how to say it. I'm not eloquent enough in my own being to say, God, this is what I truly desire either for somebody else or for me, or whatever my prayer is. And what is it? The Spirit searches us through our own groanings. And he says, I know what you need, and I will take this to the Godhead, and we will work it out for you. It's not saying that I'm making my own groanings. It's my inner person is making my own groanings, because I can't express. And, but he says that's an angelic language. It's a prophetic language. Taking that verse entirely, and he's quoted that verse to justify that this is why he does it, when it doesn't even closely resemble that. As I said, these people take verses and they, one verse without explaining anything in their surrounding context, and they say, give us money and you'll be blessed. 
or I can do this to show how great I am. And, and he continuously brings up the fact that he was given a double portion of the Spirit by his father. Because based on when Elijah was taken to heaven, Elisha said, he said, what can I do for you before I go? And Elisha said to him, um, I'd like a double portion of your spirit. And he said, you ask a hard thing. He said, if you see me depart from you to heaven, then you will receive a double portion of my spirit. If you don't, then you won't. Okay? It's up to God, not up to me. Okay? Well, he sees Elisha go up in a whirlwind in chariots of fire, right? And the Lord gave him a double portion of his spirit. Well, his father, the great prophet Oral Roberts, promised that he would receive a double portion of his spirit. And his son, like a dutiful son, just stayed there until the moment he died, waiting to watch his father die so that he could get a double portion of his father's spirit. And now he uses this as justification for getting people to send him money. And that it's, it's unreal that I am a prophet. Not only am I a prophet, I'm double the prophet of my father. It, it, it's the most perverse, twisted thinking that I can imagine. And yet he promises, because of his ability to exercise this double portion, that he writes his name on little prayer cloths and he sells them. And if you get this prayer cloth, you're going to be blessed and you're going to get rich because of it. And all these stupid things that people throw their lives away on. Oh, we, we better stop. Oh, oh. It, it, it's terrible. Please, wherever we were, go ahead, because I've lost my place. Whew. Nine. Okay, go ahead. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters opened with unto grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. Keep going? Yep. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. Three, uh, the three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. When all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done everything... I've done nothing to being put in a dungeon. Okay, so you see the symbology, the wine, also three days, you know, that's, it's kind of like a prophecy of Jesus, three days in the grave, and he is the vine, we are the branches, you can see all of the same symbology of Jesus in here, okay, um, but without being direct in this particular case, but it is giving you prophetic pictures of what Jesus' ministry will be like. Okay, go ahead. Chief Baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation. He said to Joseph, I too have a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread, and in the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Okay, so this guy is all excited because he says, wow, this guy's going to be out of jail in three days. And he's like, woohoo, you know, I had a dream too. But uh, we know that it's not going to turn out too well. But before we go on, I want to ask, what else budded and brought forth uh, blossoms like the vine in, that we just read about. I, I kind of skipped over that. That's right. Well, well not Moses' staff. Le Le Aaron's staff. That's right. That's okay, though. It was when the 12 tribes rebelled against Moses. They, for the third time in a row, they're rebelling against Moses. And so he says, have the leader of each tribe of Israel bring his staff before me. Inscribe their name on the, the, the staff so we know for certain whose it is, and then he went and he placed them before the Lord overnight. The next day he brought out all the staffs and Aaron's rod had budded. Not only did it bud, but it blossomed and it brought forth um, almonds, okay? All in a single night. And so they took that staff and they set it by as a perpetual memory for the people of Israel by the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, that's mentioned also in the book of Hebrews. But there you go. I mean, it, God was demonstrating to him that he had elected Aaron, not only had he elected Aaron for the job, but he meant it because they had to go through all of that rigmarole just to prove that he was the person that Moses had said all along, right? And, you know, you think about it, if Moses really wasn't doing things on the up and up, don't you think he would have said, I'm going to be the high priest? You know what I mean? Instead, it's his brother. It, it, it's just, it, people don't think things through logically, you know? 
I, it just, it, it's just the way of the world. But anyway, so that's a, a, you know, a, another case of something budding, budding and blossoming and bringing forth fruit all in a single night. 